So Douglas left America in mid August 1845 and um, he started his tour in Ireland. He was meant to be here just for a few weeks, but that turned into four, four and a half months. And then after that, he went to Britain for another 18 or so months. Um, he started in Dublin, then worked his way south to Western Waterford and came to Cork at the beginning of October 1845. Um, he gave his first speech at Lloyd Hotel on 65 um, George Street, which is now Otto Trumpet Street, and it's kind of the side entrance to Katie's, the furniture store. Um, this building had been a hotel kind of from the 1820s to the 1920s under different guises. It kind of ended up being Turner Hotel and um, um, I think there's a lot of uh, IRA connections with the Turner Hotel at the time of the, uh, of the rebellion. Um, so he spoke there on the morning of uh, 14th of October at 8.30. I think it was called an act of slavery breakfast. It was basically a meet and greet for Douglas and some of the kind of city leaders. There was aldermen there, there was um, solicitors, barristers. Um, one of the people there was John Francis McGuire, the editor of the recently established um, Cork Examiner newspaper. And the Examiner had a little notice of the anti slavery breakfast and it um, carried some of Douglas's uh, brief speech there. First, you will remember that I was a slave, that I am still a slave, that I am still a slave according to the law of the state in which I ran, and according to the general government of the state of North America. About seven years ago, I was spoken of a slave, of as a slave, and was considered in the same light as a beast or a creeping thing. I was the same as chattel, a thing of household and property, to be bought and sold or used according to the will of my master. I was subject to all the evils and horrors of slavery, to the lash, the chain, the thumbscrew, and even as I stand here before you, I bear on my back the marks of the lash. So as well as these um, city aldermen and um, other people, the uh, members of the Cork Anti-Slavery Society and the Cork Lady Anti-Slavery Society were also in attendance. These two bodies have been in existence for quite a number of years. They had um, played a role in the um, abolition of slavery in the West Indies in the 1830s and um, Cork's connection with that slavery went back further still. At one point in the 1790s there was a Cork Quaker called Samuel Neal who was kind of a go-between between an American Quaker, Anthony Benezet, who was um, trying to end slavery and um, Edmund Burke, the Irish politician and statesman. So, so Benezet would, 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 would connect with Samuel Neal, he would connect with um, Thomas uh, Burke and Burke then would be connected with uh, Thomas Clarkson or Edmund Burke and then Thomas Clarkson. So Cork had a role in that kind of 1790s movement to end uh, the transatlantic slave trade and um, Cork Quakers were uh, to the fore of that as they were of the later Cork uh, and slavery society. Um, not all these efforts were welcomed. Uh, there were merchants in Cork who had all this profit and made some money from the um, trade in the West Indies, and um, they would have said things like the slave people of the West Indies were perfectly content until the white and goody abolition skin came along. But that's kind of also a, a sign that they were, you know, they were festival, they saw what way the tide was turning. Um, at one point there was also a, what you call a precursor to a fair trade shop. There was a shop in Cork that sold sweets and jellies. Um, that was made from sugar made in India, the subcontinent, rather than in the West Indies. Um, so this was, you know, like there's all, there was always these things percolating around in Cork in the city. Um, at this point, you know, talk about the merchants, the Cork merchants, and the Port of Cork making money from uh, the from the Caribbean. I think it's always worth reminding ourselves that Ireland kind of sometimes seems to have clean hands in terms of slave and slave trade, but um, that's not due to any moral superiority. We were not allowed to trade in sugar and enslaved people. There were a series of navigation laws that were um, set up by with the British Parliament in the 1600s and 1700s. So they kept those big money items for ports like Bristol and Glasgow. So it wasn't that Irish businessmen, Cork merchants chose to step away from the slave trade. They, um, no doubt, that they would have been in, in a heartbeat if they if they if they could have been. Uh, so I think it's always um, important to keep that in mind. Uh, 
Um, so you know, it means that cities like Cork are not as you know, you, you, it's not like Bristol and Glasgow. You walk down the streets and there's buildings named after you know people who you know enslaved people. But it's um, you know, Cork was it wouldn't have taken much for it to have gone that way. Uh, so after speaking at Lloyd's Hotel, same day, Douglas went up to the city courthouse to give a speech at two o'clock. Um, the room that he spoke in, and, uh, and then we here we have uh, Paul Oakley Stovall, who was here last summer, uh, reciting some of Douglas' speech at the courthouse steps. Um, this is kind of Douglas's first really introduction to the city. Uh, the speech had been well publicised, it was free to attend, and so all the newspapers say that it was strong before he got there. Um, he began his speech, it was a two hour speech called I'm Here to Spread Light on American Slavery. And he began as follows. There is nothing slavery dislikes half so much as delight. It is a gigantic system of iniquity that feeds and lives in darkness and, like a tree with its roots turned to the sun, it perishes when exposed to the light. We want to arouse public indignation against the system of slavery and to bring the concentrated execrations of the civilized world to bear on it like a thunderbolt. He went on, <clears throat> the slaveholders of America resort to every species of cruelty, but they can never reduce the slave to a willing obedience. The natural elasticity of the human soul repels the slightest attempt to enslave it. The black slaves of America are not wholly without that elasticity. They are men, and being so, they do not submit readily to the yoke. It is easy to keep a brute in the position of a brute. But when you undertake to take a man in the same state, believe me, you must build your fences higher and your doors firmer than before. A brute you may molest sometimes with impunity, but never a man. Men, the black slaves of America, are capable of resenting an insult, of revenging an outrage, and of looking defiant at their masters. Um, later on, Douglas spoke about the relationship between religion and slavery. In America, he said, Bibles and slaveholders go hand in hand. The church and the slave prison stand together, and when you hear the chanting of psalms in one, you hear the clanking of chains in the other. The man who wields the cowhide during the week fills the pulpit on Sunday. Here we have robbery and religion united, devils dressed in angels' garments. The man who whipped me in the week used to attempt to show me the way of life on the Sabbath. Uh, that last quote leads us uh, to the next stage for Douglas. So a few days later, on the evening of the 17th, he spoke to Wesley in Methodist Chapel uh, on 101 St. Patrick Street. So uh, this building had been built in the early 1800s, and John Wesley himself, the uh, founding father of Methodism, he had come to court on a number of occasions in the mid to late 1700s. Um, Wesley had called slavery and slave trade the extra the execrable sum of all human villainies. And initially, when Methodists, Methodism made its way to America, it was firmly anti-slavery. Methodists were not allowed to hold enslaved people. But as the religion became more popular in the South, the church leaders kind of became, began to make accommodations with um, slave owners and slavery. They kind of relegated the question of slavery from a moral principle to a kind of a personal business affair between the so-called masters and the so-called slaves. Um, Douglas was brought up around and among Methodists and was a Methodist himself. He was a member of the AME Zion Church. And um, I've always felt that because Methodism was the religion closest to his heart, it's the one that he attacked the most viciously in his narrative and in speeches, including here in the court, where um, he spoke about at the moment the minister's salary was made dependent on the slaveholder, that moment the ardour of the pulpit against slavery ceased. Um, at the speech in the Wesleyan Chapel, Douglas always spoke, also spoke out against um, Presbyterians and Baptists and uh, other Protestant denominations, all of whom condoned slavery in the South. Um, he quoted uh, a note in the newspaper about the will of a, of a recently deceased uh, Baptist minister, uh, a Reverend Dr. Furman. So this will, it said, um, what was 
what's left of Strother Manor Estate included a tract of the first quality of fine land on the waters of the Black River, a lot of land in the town of Camden, a library of miscellaneous character, chiefly theological, 27 Negroes, some of them very prime, two mules, one horse, and an old wagon. Um, so, you know, if we bring simply to, um, you know, like how, you know, black people and slave people were viewed. Um, Douglas concluded that speech by urging all Protestant denominations, of course, to have no fellowship with their brethren in America, so long as their, he said, their hands will be smeared with human blood. Um, but it's also worth in mind for remembering that the Methodist Church in America was not wholly condoning slavery. There were many Methodist ministers in the north who helped enslave people along the Underground Railroad, helped them get to Canada, helped them escape. And so these splits in the church. Um, it led to the creation of the Methodist Church of the South in the mid 1840s, and the Episcopalians, the Baptists, they also had these splits. So, and these splits are kind of precursors of the great split that would happen between the states um, 20 years later, um, on the, the onset of the, of the American Civil War. Um, after the speech at the Wesley Methodist Chapel, um, Douglas sold copies of his book. He did this after all the speeches because this was his means of getting around the British Isles. This was his money. And you could also buy copies of his book in Bradford and Co., which is now the Air Store, and a number of other shops along Patrick Street, um, including one that would have been where the, um, so the stores uh, uh, building is now and where the feminist building is now. Um, the money, as well as using it to go around, he also sent a portion of it back to America where his wife Anna was living and looking after and raising uh, his young family with four young children. But she uh, made her own money, um, mending shoes and clothes, and so she actually kept all of the money that Frederick sent back. Um, so uh, you know, she was just too perfect to kind of keep that and you know, her own world and take care of the family without necessarily depending on Frederick, because he was coming and going a lot toward North America and uh, later to travel abroad. Um, after the Wesley Methodist Chapel, we kind of go down Patrick Street a bit and then turn right onto Academy Street. And at 12 Academy Street, we had the Temperance Institute. Um, compared to the Reform Movement, the Catholic Emancipation, Temperance is kind of a forgotten about movement, but at the time it was absolutely phenomenally large in the late 1830s, early 1840s. So the campaign to kind of limit or just abstain totally from the use of alcohol. Uh, had at one point supposedly 5 million of Ireland's 8 million inhabitants had taken the pledge to abstain from alcohol. Um, and it doesn't really matter that they maybe weren't all serious, it does, it does give a, a sense of how vibrant and strong the movement was. The temperance movement, the 19th century temperance movement, had also originated in America in the 1820s and it was particularly strong among free blacks of the northern states. And there was a sense that temperance was essential to black elevation, and it wasn't long before the two causes were seen as synonymous on both sides of the, of, of the Atlantic. Um, Douglas was teetotal by the time he came to Ireland, but he admitted, and you know, it said in his narrative that he would have drunk a lot when he was younger, when he was working as a steel hand. He explained how those who enslaved people would ply those who enslaved with alcohol at kind of holidays like uh, Easter and Christmas time, kind of just to keep their minds dull, uh, to keep their thoughts free of slavery or free of freedom and, 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 and any thought of escape. Um, and so with these two movements being seen as synonymous, this was kind of, um, we'll see a bit of Douglas's um, kind of, where he moves from being a single issue campaigner, kind of, you know, tackling a number of issues, and he said at the Temple Institute that mankind has been drunk. I believe that if the slaveholder would be sober for a moment, would consider the sinfulness of his position, we could get a public opinion sufficiently strong to break the relation of master and slave. All great reforms go together. Whatever tends to elevate, whatever tends to exalt humanity in one portion of the world, tends to be exalted in another part. The same feeling that warms the heart of the philanthropist here animates that of the lover of humanity in every country. Uh, Douglas also spoke at some other temperance venues in Cork, 
including St. Patrick's Temperance Hall, which was on Blarney Street, which is now uh, Shandon Street. The building doesn't exist, we don't think anymore, but we think it might have been where this building was. So this is the Father O'Leary Memorial Boys Club, um, just at the top of Shandon Street. And so that was built in the 1880s. So we think that whatever building was there first was the site of St. Patrick's Temperance Hall. It was at the St. Patrick's Temperance Hall that a poem was written and recited in Douglas's honour. It's called um, Cade Wheel of Fallship to the Stranger. Um, it was written by a local poet called Daniel Casey, whose um, books are available, I think, up in the stores here in the library. Um, just a few verses from that poem. A stranger from a distant nation, we welcome thee with acclamation, and as a brother warmly greet thee, rejoice in air, air and isle to meet thee. Then cave we'll afford you to the stranger, free from bondage, chains and danger. Who could have heard by half the story of tyrants, camping, base and gory? Whose heart trod not for deep pulsation, for the trampled slaves' emancipation? Then cave we'll afford you to the stranger, free from bondage, chains and danger. Um, it's called a poem, but it's also been called a song in other places. I think the line between those two was uh, a lot more loose than it is now. Um, and Douglas actually has a handwritten copy of that poem in his um, papers that can be found in the Library of Congress in, in Washington. And Daniel Casey included that poem in a later collection of his, and he spoke about how Douglas had spoken that night and had really you know, enjoyed and been um, impressed by and appreciative of the poem. After St. Patrick's Temperance Hall, we'll move on to Brown Street. Um, so Ali's Kitchen on Fall Street, we think a building that, that, uh, that, that's housed in is the last remnant of Brown Street, which was knocked down in the 1980s for St. Paul or for uh, the Portland Shopping Centre. Now Brown Street was the area that Douglas stayed in for the months for the duration of his stay in Cork. So he stayed with a family called the Jenning family. They or soda water, mineral water manufacturer, but they're also involved in every social cause going. Um, there was father was Thomas, the wife was Anne, and there was eight children. Um, very successful business people, philanthropists, activists. Um, the house was always very busy, full, talking to ladies reforms, and Douglas really enjoyed his time there, he felt exhilarated by it. He got extremely close to um, one of the sisters, Isabel Jennings, and um, she wrote how he was a noble hearted man who felt immediately like a friend. Her sister Jane would also write about how um, how we are a large family. My mother, three brothers, and five sisters generally considered not easily pleased, but Frederick was the affection of every one of us. So, the Jennings family both lived and worked on Brown Street. Um, if this was the kind of work building, it the the, the, you can see the windows and doors, they, you can certainly imagine being opened and you know, like goods being winched up and down. The, um, for the doors, you can imagine the, the, horse, and, the horse and cart being loaded. Um, it was the Jennings uh, building, which you know, like we think it might have been, you know, it's very easy to imagine Douglas being shown around it. The house he stayed in then would either be next door to it or opposite it. So, um, but you still get a sense of the kind of red brick building that he would have stayed in, the, the area of the city that he would have stayed in for the months of his duration here. Um, Isabel and Jane were both members of the Cork Ladies Anti-Slavery Society as well. Isabel was the secretary, so she would have been in communication a lot with the um, abolitionists in America. One of the things that anti-slavery activists in the Britain and Ireland did was they would make lots of hand made hand sewn items that would then be shipped across to America for what was called the Boston Bazaar, which was held every Christmas. It was a big fundraising event for the American Anti-Slavery Society. And it was always said that the items that came from across the Atlantic always fetched the, the highest price. So um, that was the one way that Irish people and British people contributed to 
the um, like the slavery movement here in America, and Isabel is kind of orchestrated all of that from Cork, and then she'd get up to Dublin, and then it'd go across to to, to Boston. Um, <clears throat> the Jennings family, they were also a Unitarian family, and we have here the Unitarian Church, um, which was built in 1717 and is still in use. Um, we don't know exactly that Douglas set foot in the church, but staying for a month with the leading Unitarian family in the city, less than 100 metres from the Unitarian Church, you know, it's a beggar belief that he didn't go and visit and, um, you know, have a, have a look around. Um, another Unitarian who helped Douglas all this time was Richard Dowden, who was a business partner of the Jennings, and he was also the mayor of Cork at the time. Jennings, he is another, or Dowden, he's another man who's involved in all the social movements, repeal, Catholic emancipation, local, uh, local Cork issues. He was involved in establishing lots of educational initiatives like the School of Design. There was a plaque for him in the Crawford Gallery, which was at one point the home of the School of Design. And um, Dowden was kind of Douglas's constant companion to Cork. He, was, he would have chaired a lot of the meetings and uh, they became quite close as well. And when Douglas eventually left Cork and moved up to Limerick, he wrote a letter back down to Richard Dowden kind of expressing his gratitude for all that he had done. My dear sir, allow me to express to you, as well as words can, my deep sense of the obligations I am under to yourself and the many attentions that you were pleased to show me during my somewhat protracted stay in the city of which you are the highly honoured Chief Executive Officer. I think I am too well acquainted with the motive that guided you and your kind offices toward me for a moment to suppose that you are desirous of such an expression from me. Indeed, I know you require no such expression at my hand, and I am therefore the more anxious to do it. Not for the purposes of rewarding you, I do it, my dear sir, to ease a heart swelling with gratitude. I have travelled a great deal during the last few years and I have met with many benefactors but never have I met with one in your station having so many public cares and weighty responsibilities to bear and yet so ready, so willing and anxious to do both time, talent and official influence to the advancement of the noblest objects like yourself. I speak just what I feel and what all who are acquainted with the fact will confess to be true when I say that to yours and the deep interest which the Miss Jennings took in me and my mission, I am almost entirely indebted for the success which attended my humble efforts within the good city of Cork. I shall ever remember my visit with pleasure, and never shall I think of Cork without remembering that yourself and the kind friends just named constituted the source from whence flowed much delight, life and warmth of humanity, which I found in that good city. Um, Dowden also gave Douglas a present of a ring which he kept for many years but we think might have been lost when one of his houses um, went on fire. Um, at one point there Douglas references the um, weighty responsibilities that Dowden was bearing <clears throat> and this is a good moment to um, you know kind of come into the wider thing because a few days after Douglas left Dowden was in communication with Dublin Council and the authorities in Dublin about the incipient potato famine and of course, we didn't know it was a founded stage, but about the, the potato shortage that was, you know, like starting to evidence itself. Um, and this happened really quickly because when Douglas arrived in, in Dublin late August, the newspapers were full of how bountiful the harvest looked. Um, but by the time he'd left Dublin, so within that month, it had all changed and, you know, very rapidly uh, descended. And so Dowden was dealing with that, but also showing Douglas around. And so, you know, Douglas would have been getting some insight into. Kind of you know what struggles would have been facing kind of the um, the Irish people and 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 how they would uh, cope with it or deal with it. Um, but like I said, it's important. It just at the time then it would have also been seen as just one of the many periodic food shortages we had. It wasn't you know when Douglas was here, it wasn't seen or known to be you know the devastating famine that it would have become. Um, <clears throat> kind of crossing Southgate Bridge, there's a number of areas of interest kind of all clusters together. <clears throat> um, near the bottom of Barrack Street, there used to be a, a small street called Globe Lane um, that was demolished when they were doing some work in the Keys in the 1880s, 1890s. So in Globe Lane was the Globe Lane Temperance Hall, and this is actually where Douglas made his first public appearance in court. Um, 
he had just been brought along. There was a, a celebration in honour of Father Matthew's birthday. And so, though he didn't give an official speech, he was at one point called upon to give a few words, and he, he did that. Um, that link with Father Matthew then brings us to Cove Street, which is just behind the old Foss building. Um, Father Matthew's house is no longer there. There's a little plaque marking the, the street. But um, Douglas was very, very impressed with Father Matthew, and um, he met him at a few of the talks, and Father Matthew invited him to his house for breakfast on one of the mornings. Um, Douglas gave a, a quite a full some re uh, report recording of this in one of his letters back to uh, to America. He described how uh, Father Matthew ran out the front door and you know like called him welcome welcome my dear sir to my humble abode. <clears throat> it was a simple unprepossessing home, and Matthew guided Douglas by the hand through the rough passage and up some stairs to the main room. There was no carpet on the floor and very little furniture, just an old-fashioned sideboard. A table and chairs and three or four pictures hung carelessly around the walls. The breakfast was set when I set in, when I went in, Douglas recalled. A large urn stood in the middle, surrounded by cups, saucers, plates, knives and forks, all of a very plain order. Too plain, I thought, for so great a man. Um, Douglas uh, seemed you know, somewhat in awe of Matthew, and he recalled how his whole soul appeared to be wrapped up in the temperance cause. His time, strength and money are all freely given to the cause, and his success is truly wonderful. When he is at home, his house is literally surrounded with persons, many of whom have come miles to take the pledge. He was called away twice while I was there. Um, although he told for eight years by the stage, Douglas saw the opportunity of taking the pledge from the man he called the living saviour of Ireland, and it was too good to pass up. So Matthew complied and with promptness and gave me a beautiful silver badge. I now reckon myself with delight the fifth of the last five of Father Matthew's 5,487,495 temperance children. Um, what Douglas says about people travelling far to, 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 um, come to, Douglas, to, to come to Matthew is very true because you could take the pledge from a priest in your locality, but it seemed to carry more weight if you got it from Father Matthew, and it also gave that sense of pilgrimage that was kind of you know, deep in the Irish soul. So people would you know, leave Galway, go to Contemporary, walk for days and days, come down to Father Matthew's small house, wait for him to appear, and uh, get the pledge from him and, and head home. Um, Douglas's relationship with Matthew did not stay so strong, however. Um, at one point, 1849, Father Matthew, this is after kind of the, the famine exodus of, of, of people, Father Matthew travelled over to America to try and kind of um, reignite the temperance cause amongst the Irish um, population in America. And that included he wanted to travel south to the Irish in the south. And he didn't want really to get into any trouble or cause a stir. So even though he had spoken out against slavery in the past, when he was invited onto kind of anti-slavery platforms in America, he declined. And um, this is very disappointing for Douglas. Um, you wrote kind of how he too had fallen uh, in reference to Father Matthew. Um, there's one, I think Douglas is also meant to have spoken at a horse bazaar in Cork. We don't know exactly where it is, but there was a horse bazaar that Father Matthew used to hold temperance meetings in on Mary Street, which is very close to Cove Street. So we think that was probably the location of the horse bazaar. And also in that area of the city, it's um, just worth knowing about and remembering that um, Douglas's uh, descendant, his great 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 grandson Kenneth Morris Jr. was over here last summer and he planted a tree there with the Lord Mayor and in Nananaka Place, and that is there and uh, certainly available to be visited by anyone who should so choose. And there are Definitely a few um, events during Douglas Feast going on again at Nanonagle Place and including the Cork Migrant Centre. So, kind of coming back across the river, um, we go to the Imperial Hotel. And Douglas spoke here on Thursday, the 23rd of October in the afternoon. This was kind of a big set piece speech. It was the first one that charged an entrance fee, so this is kind of a big fundraiser for him as well. Um, so he had, you know, he had spoken to the masses at various halls, so this is definitely for the, um, the upper echelons of Cork society. Um, 
It was held in a room called Mr. MacDowell's Great Room, which is now the Duchess Suite, which is kind of on the ground floor, kind of behind the foyer, near where that um, plaque uh, commemorating the visit is, and uh, the Imperial got that plaque in 2012, I think. And um, the Duchess Suite Gordon and Estate organised it, worked with the Imperial, and there was you know, potential for a statue of Douglas to be on the outside there soon, and um, things so. So this speech was called American Prejudice Against Colour. And his main theme in the speech was the supposed intellectual inferiority of black people in America. <clears throat> there is perhaps no argument more frequently resorted to by the slaveholders in support of the slave system than the inferiority of the slave. This is the burden of all in their defense of the institution of slavery. The Negro is degraded, he is ignorant, he is inferior, and therefore it is right to enslave him. And Douglas continued, I will grant, frankly, I must grant, that the Negroes in America are inferior to, inferior to whites. But why are they so is another question, and a question to which I will call your attention for a few moments. The people of America deprive us of every privilege. They turn around and taunt us with our inferiority, they stand upon our necks. They impudently taunt us and ask the question, why we don't stand up erect? They tie our feet and ask us why we don't run. That is the position of America at the present time. The laws forbid education. The mother must not teach her child the letters of the Lord's Prayer. And then, when this unfortunate state of things exists, they turn around and ask why we are not moral and intelligent and tell us, because we are not, that they have the right to enslave. So this is Douglas kind of taking attack on the kind of the underlying systemic racist substructure of um, you know like why slave people um, were, were, were seen to be intellectually inferior to uh, to white people. Um, and the imperial also was the was the um, venue a number of years later for other. Um, Slavery activists like Sarah uh, Ramon Parker who visited in the 1850s, and um, you know, part of the project. So at the moment we're focusing on the Douglas store um, because it's so well recorded. But in time, you want to have a kind of a broader focus on abolition store, so to follow all the other anti-slavery activists and how and where they spoke in the city. Um, so it's an ongoing project. Um, from the Imperial, we head down to the. What, what, what used to be the independent church, um, independent, another name for kind of the, what in America called the Congregationalists. So it's, um, this building was built on the site of the old assembly halls in the 1830s, early 1830s, built by the same um, brothers, architectural brothers who did um, kind of the, the courthouse, the um, James and Richard Payne. Um, when Delta spoke here, it was the 3rd of November, it was um, his last big event in the city. And although he did speak himself, it was mainly about celebrating his visit and um, a number of addresses and, and resolutions in its honor of war, war said and recited by, 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 by people from Cork. So at one point we had the Joint Committee of the Cork Anti-Slavery Society and the Cork Ladies Anti-Slavery Society. They wrote a joint address and which was read out to Douglas by the Mayor Richard Dowden. And <coughs> it began allow us to express our sense of the advantages that the cause by which we are bound together as societies has derived from your labours in Cork during your short visit here, and to request you to transmit to the abolitionists of America our estimation of their services to the holy cause in which we are engaged. By your labours here, we have been stirred up to renewed and active life for the deliverance of the captive. We feel that if not associated with him by the ties of a common government, we are bound to his relief by a higher and holier claim, the revealed and universal truth of common humanity and a common origin. Seeds of truth, which can never be eradicated, have been disseminated by you in numerous public assemblies here and sent far and wide through the instrumentality of the liberal public press. By your addresses, the mass of the people have had an opportunity, which they eagerly embraced, of gaining knowledge their best sympathies have been aroused on behalf of those suffering 
under an evil of greater magnitude than the most abject poverty. They have benefited, been benefited by being made aware of how they too might do something to hasten the emancipation of the American slave from his debasing bondage, simply by forming a portion of the public sentiment of the world, which must finally awaken the American government and people to a sense of the degraded position in which their support of a hideous slave system places them amongst the civilized nations of the earth. Um, so soon after this speech on the 3rd of November, Douglas left Cork, he went up to Limerick, Dublin, Belfast, and then on to um, the British Isles. Um, he, his freedom was purchased by a uh, group of Quakers in Newcastle at one point, uh, in, in late 1846. So when he returned to America in the spring of 1847, it was as a free man. Um, so that set, on, set him on the next kind of stage of his development. It's when he set up his own newspaper, he kind of moved away from the American anti-slavery society, became his own kind of mass movement and the kind of cultural figure that we kind of now know. Um, but he did come back to the British Isles and he came back to Ireland briefly in the summer of 1887 by now the elder statesman of world affairs. Um, for that, we'll, that brings you back to the Grand Parade, where we have a few um, items of note. There's the mural, which was um, done by Kevin O'Brien, the artist, in response to the murder of George Floyd um, in, in the summer of 2020 and the kind of rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. And we also have, also in Grand Parade, the library's own exhibition um, on display for the, for the Cork public. And what's um, worry about knowing about the Grand Parade of the link is, is that when Douglas was in Ireland in 1887, he didn't leave Dublin, but he did communicate with Isabel Jennings, who was still living in Cork. And by this stage, she had moved from Brown Street and was living on the Grand Parade, where uh, the Cork Central Shoes would have been, that kind of area. Um, at this stage, they're just, they're two old people, and their letters are basically about who's dead and who's not, and what ailments are suffering from. <clears throat> Isabel wrote, um, oh well, there was still a great deal of affection in the letters. Um, he would have always called her the Eriza uh, in his letters, and um, he would have, you know, been quite open with her. Uh, like at one at points when he was travelling through the British Isles, he would have, you know, opened up to her about his homesickness, how he was, um, you know, feeling guilty about kind of being meant to have gone home to America after say four months, but then kind of staying extra long time because the meeting was going so well. But then. You know, the sense of abandonment of his wife and children. So, you know, they, they, they had a deep, deep connection. And um, so here in 1887, she wrote back to him in Dublin, but you may not know that only three of the large family in Brown Street now remain in this region called the world, giving the dates and, um, of the deaths of her parents and siblings. She too had problems with cataracts, but was now wonderfully recovered. Nevertheless, at 74, she said she looked on death as a dear friend, although, to the dear loving father, I leave the time. Douglas too, at this stage, was increasingly aware of his own mortality and um, writing to Richard Allen, one of the Quakers who had helped him out in Dublin a few years earlier, on the possibility of returning to Ireland, he had suggested that while there were a good many people whose hand he would like to shake again, it did not matter if he did it in this world or the next. It will not be long before we all meet on the other shore, Douglas had um, said then. And, um, I think I will close it at that. Thank you.